Artemis 1 has just launched successfully, Orion is heading to the moon and the big orange rocket has been spent is what I would have liked to have said right now. Sadly though, due to naughty engine number 3, the launch has been scrubbed. We still have news to talk about though. This is your Artemis 1 launch edition of Tomorrow Space News. The day though didn't get to the cleanest of starts with two big issues surfacing. The bleed valve on engine 3 wasn't working properly and a crack was spotted on the intertank section from an engineering camera. A crack in the tank sounded incredibly anti-launch but eventually after some deep analysis by the talented engineers in charge of looking after this monster of a rocket it was discovered that the crack was only in the orange insulation foam, the tank structure itself was not harmed. It looked worse however as air from the outside was getting stuck in this foam crack and then being frozen because of the fuel's cryogenic temperatures inside. We waited and waited and waited and then sadly we received the news which we kind of been waiting for. The launch of Artemis 1 would be scrubbed for this window. At the time of writing we still haven't received a full debrief on the issues with engine 3. All we know is the engineers weren't observing the expected temperatures leaving the engine not in the thermal requirements for launch. They tried to troubleshoot the issue closing the valve that sent the bleed into the other engines trying to increase the pressure for engine 3 but it just wouldn't budge. Depending on how bad the issue is, there could be a variety of outcomes. The best outcome is that this problem can be solved in a few hours or a couple of days, and SLS is ready for launch again for the next window, which opens at 1648 UTC this Friday, September 2nd. A worse outcome is the need for actual repairs inside the VAB, which would require a rollback. I don't think anyone would want that, we want to see it fly, but considering we don't believe that this system was tested during the wet dress rehearsals, I wouldn't be surprised if it does indeed happen. Hopefully though, we'll all congregate again on Friday to see NASA's return to the moon and it does give us another opportunity to get very excited again. Another heavy lift rocket has been in the news recently though and it's a little more shiny than SLS. A good old friend Booster 7 is back. It rolled out of the Mega Bay last week with all 33 Raptor 2 engines installed and headed to the launch site. It was rolled in between the chopstick arms which are now back in operation and placed onto the orbital launch mount. Once on the OLM, B7 has been testing. It has performed multiple spin prime tests which is when the turbo pumps are spun up but there isn't an ignition. Ship 24 has also been doing some spin prime tests such as this one on Thursday. Talking test tanks, the elliptical dome tank was rolled back to the production site on Wednesday. The next day, test tank B7.1 was returned to the launch site. This tank was previously here doing some cryogenic tests on the can crusher, more properly known as the structural test stand. In non-Starship related news, just a bit of a fun thing, the US Air Force F-22 Raptor demonstration team flew over Starbase on Thursday. Make sure to head over to NASA Space Flight's channel to see the full flyover, there were some epic manoeuvres. Of course, the next day, Jared Isaacman showed up as well in his MiG-29 before going back and picking up his Polaris buddies as well. Star Factory is also closing in on the front side with siding being added on already. We won't really be able to see inside at the progress past this point, which is a shame, but it also means that SpaceX will soon have a brand new factory. Another event to happen at Starbase in the last week was the SpaceX and T-Mobile collaboration announcement, which the carrier is calling coverage above and beyond. Pretty much to sum it up, SpaceX will be teaming up with T-Mobile, giving their customers on the quote, most popular plans, the ability to be connected anywhere within the United States, except for the most northern parts of Alaska, where Starlink currently does not serve. The new phased array antennas on the next generation Starlink 2 satellites will allow for this, and it means that there will be no more mobile dead zones in the US. Now this isn't going to be incredible bandwidth, it's going to be 2-4 to four megabits over an entire cell which could have several thousand people within it but it's enough for basic text communication and phone calls which is plentiful when you're in an emergency scenario and you're out of range of a cell tower. T-Mobile has also invited other international carriers to collaborate on this plan which would be very useful for nations where either there are a lot of black spots or the infrastructure is less developed. It would also give T-Mobile customers access to the Starlink service in those international carriers regions and vice versa. 
We talked about this new service and the implications of it during our most recent live show, so if you want more information and community opinions, head over there and check it out. Right now though, we're going to look at some of the more boring launches over the past week. First up, we head to China with the launch of Chuangxin-16 on a Kuai Zhou-1A rocket which commenced at 0236 UTC on the 23rd of August from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The payload mass is unknown, but we know it was sent into a 596 by 590 km low Earth orbit with an inclination of 29.01 degrees. The following day, August 24th, at 0301 UTC, China was launching again, specifically with this Long March 2D, and inside the payload fairing was Beijing 3B. This mission launched from LC-9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center to a 615 by 592 km, 97.94 degree polar orbit. This remote sensing optical satellite is a following up Beijing 3A, which launched in 2021. We of course also had a Starlink launch during the past week, which was Group 4 Mission 23. This batch of 54 satellites launched at 0441 Coordinated Universal Time from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. All 54 satellites were successfully delivered to their 336 by 232 km 53.22 degree initial orbits and they'll raise themselves up over the coming weeks. In the next seven days, currently scheduled is Starlink Group 3 Mission 4 from Vandenberg Space Force Base, of course Artemis 1 again from the Kennedy Space Center on SLS, and then another Starlink flight, Group 420, with an additional payload called Varuna. Thank you to all the citizens of tomorrow for financially supporting the show. They helped to keep the lights on at Station 204, which, being a space station, is quite expensive to operate. If you want to see Space News scripts as they're being written and you want access to our pre and post live show community hangouts, head to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join or the join button below to join the ground support suborbital, orbital and escape velocity citizens as well as Neurostream today. That's not it for this week as we still have an Artemis launch to cover. On Wednesday, Dr. Tamitha Skive will hopefully have another episode of Space Weather before I return on Friday with a review of the launch of Artemis 1, assuming it goes ahead that is. We'll then have our weekly live show also on Friday, but a bit later in the day. Thanks for watching, hopefully the next time I see you we'll have some SRB thunder to listen to. See you on Friday and goodbye.